All right, here we are. Welcome to the class, How to Become a Space Weather Watcher with myself, Alexis of Ascension Diaries. I'm going to be leading you through this short class. And at the end, we're going to be doing a question and answer. So thank you to all of you for attending the live class. Much appreciated. And for those of you watching the recording, I can't wait to read your comments. I'm always on standby. I see everything that happens online. So go ahead and reach out whenever you feel you need to. So without further ado, here we go. How to become a space weather watcher strategy and utility for all ages. So what I'm offering you guys. I want you to again, write down your questions for the end of this presentation. Those of you watching. And hello again, my name is Alexis. I am a space weather researcher online and a psychic medium therapist in person. I am teaching an observation on observing space weather online as Ascension Diaries. The, the name of my brand or my blog is called Ascension Diaries. And this has been going on for the past five years. I've been doing this work. So shout out to those of you who've been watching me for the last few years. Those of you who are new, welcome aboard. I'm only just building momentum. So I'm excited to have you. This class will help you check everything quickly on your mobile or internet device, which is what I have streamlined this study to be so I can help others get ahead and continue watching as well when I'm sleeping at night. We have we need more people to know what they're doing. <clears throat> what will you achieve today? We are going to be going over easy space weather tools. So please be sure to have your phone or your computer within reach during this class. If you wanna download and find these resources along with me, that is the best way for you to begin is to do this along with me. So please don't, don't hesitate to open up your phone and start doing these things at the same time. <clears throat> we will go over tools on how to read and check this this space weather anomalies efficiently. So welcome, please share this video, share the, what you experienced in this class, share me with your friends and I will continue doing this work humbly. So what is space weather is the first thing we need to go over before we get into any of this. Space weather is any electromagnetic frequencies changing our atmosphere and our life from outside our atmosphere. We watch solar activity, astrological alignments to predict Earth's weather here on my research side of things. And what I'm going to be continuing to teach, but this is not exactly what I'm going to be showing you today, not the astrological. We're saving that for the end. We are definitely going to focus on solar activity in this one. First off, we're going to talk about Space Weather Live, the app, which I hope you will now open your phone and download the app, please, if you haven't yet, Space Weather Live. It's available on both the on both stores, so there's no excuse. If you have a smartphone, please download this app and get the notifications turned on. Bonus points if you also have a Twitter account and you can follow Space Weather Live on Twitter and find them on Twitter and turn those notifications on. For those of you who really want to get up to the second, the most, the quickest thing on the internet I've found so far is the actual tweet comes out first and then the app updates just moments after. So depending on your preference, the app is free. But of course, if you like Twitter, it is very quick. The second Twitter account I'd recommend you follow is called Solar Ham. And we're going to get more into that as well into this presentation. Please follow that if you want to get those fast notifications. It's good to get two perspectives. They tend to also post slightly different photos and slightly different details about the space, like the, so the solar activity. So that's helpful to have multiple perspectives. Go ahead and follow as many other accounts as you feel guided to, but too many always is too much in my opinion. So I'm showing you just a few. Another real solid opportunity for you to check the space weather super fast is spaceweather.com. You can have that on your phone. I like to make web pages into apps on my iPhone homepage for the, the websites that do not have an app. I just make them an app on my homepage, which you can do when you open, when you're in the browser on your phone, there is that option in the settings you can see to place on home screen 
So I would recommend you do that. It'll make itself a little app and then we'll open up that web page and reload it every time you click there on your home screen. Finally, the app Schumann Resonances app is the 199 app in the app store. I'm pretty sure it's in both app stores un unless something has changed. But this app is the only one that I would recommend that actually costs you anything at all. And it is also notification friendly. It will give you notifications on the hour about how the atmosphere is charging in Russia and in Italy. So we want to know why the atmosphere is charging for the continuance of knowing when the solar activity is actually landed on Earth. It will charge our atmosphere. So let's get into that. So please go ahead and get those resources. I'm going to keep touching on them. So it's not too late. Again, that link is in the bio of this video. Space Weather Live help. You can go to spaceweatherlive.com. Also, they have a web page. Solar activity is very, very fast. This resource is sending out notifications literally as quickly as possible about solar flares and radio blackouts as well as geomagnetic storms. But we need to know about those flares and blackouts because that's the quickest thing that happens. Here we go, solar flares. This is what, this is the money maker. This is what we all need to know and feel comfortable with because this is what we really are guarding our conscious mind and our innocent loved ones from the awareness and with the awareness of these solar flare changes. Now, something I didn't write here, but is extremely essential before I go on, is that we are currently in almost, we are approaching the center of the most potent part of our current solar cycle. So you can see here on the left, the solar flares are dependent on planetary arrangement is one big thing. So those of you getting into astrology, there's a reason we need to know we need to know what the planets are doing at all times because it's extremely helpful to predict when likely there's going to be solar flare activity. Then we take it another step up. Most people don't make it to this step, but interstellar arrangements between the other stars and in our galaxy and those sort of cycles as well are also something I'm beginning studying as a way to predict solar flares. And then finally here, like I mentioned, the 11 year solar cycle. This 11 year solar cycle, they say started around 2020. They wanted to say the newest cycle kind of started around then. And so 11 years, you know, 2011, or sorry, <laughs> that is not the right math. You know what I'm saying? In 2025, 2026 is the five, six year mark, which is the center of an 11 year cycle. And in this middle part of the cycle is usually when the sun is at its most active and then it kind of cools off to prepare for the next 11 year cycle. So we are expecting that solar weather and general is going to be increasing as we approach 2025 and 2026. So those of you who are practitioners and so on, anyone who works with energy, this is for you to solidify in your brain. The science so far has been on the side of this. The cycle seems pretty normal. And this next coming cycle is supposed to be special, which is why I'm likely training you about it this early and right now. One last addition, solar flares, this big thing, also affectionately called solar flashes a little bit in the, in the spiritual community, they are hard to photograph and are nearly instant as they affect us. So these are the most elusive, but the most powerful, most instant things that the sun is doing to recode basically the whole solar system. When it's flaring can be due to the other planets and the other stars. Um, but that science is kind of tricky because even as astrological timing, since my observations doesn't seem to be quite right. So there is like many of you know, a lot of drama about what actually is going on in space and so I'm trying to be outside of the drama and pick out the most common threads over the, over the five years that have made tried and true about this study so far. So just follow me, add it to your repertoire the best you can. So we measure these flares or these flashes with X-ray bandwidth. Now, 
there is faster frequencies that are coming out of this. The, the flare is pretty much multidimensional light, according to my opinion and my verbiage and my understanding. You could also go in the quantum direction, but I prefer saying it's multidimensional or full spectrum light. And that is an arguable thing in the science right now. We as civilians and through these apps observe the flares from classes. They class the flares with the X-ray radiation that it hits. So although all those spectrum of light is leaving that flare in that moment, what earthlings are mostly registering and these apps are telling us about are just the X-ray radiation band of this flare. So there are classes and we're going to get into that, that they measure the X-ray radiation to show severity from C to M to X. So if you see C flare on your app, you're going to know, okay, well, that's the threshold. That's where we start paying attention. And then when you see M, that's when you know things are getting serious. And when you see an X, that's when you know that you're making history because those are not as common and they are going to continue getting more common according to the science towards 2025. So really, I'm training you to be X-Men in a way. I'm training you to be able to surf these X-class flares and use it to your best benefit because that's what I've been studying since basically the second half of the last solar cycle. <laughs> I've been preparing for this. So some of the largest numbers ever recorded, I wanted to tell you, our X flare is up to an X28 back in 2003. They could have, I was even reading that some of them were arguing it could have been an X40, which I have no idea how that's even possible, but it is. And so back in 20, 2003, can you even imagine what you were even doing back in 2003? It was quite a long time ago but <laughs> it was around 20 years ago, which is almost two solar cycles ago. So we're kind of seeing these, these jumps. And now, even in the, even further back in history, they weren't getting up to an X-28. That was extremely uncommon and very strange to have this X-28 that I, I just recently kind of relearned about this. So this is a big deal, something like that, but we lived through it. Do we know exactly how? No, but we did. <laughs> and now we're gonna continue. It obviously may not have been an earth facing event and so on. If it was directly at our planet, likely would have been way more problems. But we like we'd had in the Carrington event back in 1859, it was a more earth directed thing. And the telegraph lines were melting because the electromagnetic frequency was so intense that it was causing the, the structures to basically melt that were carrying frequency. So back then, telegraph lines and more recently in 1989 and 2001, there was also some X class flares, some X20 potentially class flares. So just to kind of give you an example of our history so far that nothing insanely out of the box is happening here, but we are seeing a trend of more and more powerful X class as we get closer and further through the, the solar cycles is what I'm noticing. So here in the picture is an example of an M3 class. So X-ray, classed M3.4, and it's coming out of this hole on the left here, or this bright area on the left here. These are the moments where they attempt to photograph the flash that happens, but really what we really see is more so a lot of the time, the actual ejecta of the sun being pushed out of the way from this multidimensional magnetic flash that happens. So we're going to talk more about that. Here is the notification you will get on your phone when there is a solar flare. It's going to look like this. This literally happened just the other day, as you can see on the 29th. It was just yesterday. So here's some details. You're going to see the time there in universal time. So you're going to need to know where you're at compared to universal time as a scientist. Just figure that out. It takes two seconds. You'll be able to know and compare. But good thing about the instant notifications is that you're where what time it is where you are is 
that time difference between the UTC. So you can do that math pretty quick if you're paying attention. And the final thing here is that there was a velocity of 4,335 kilometers per second from this particular type two radio admission. So this is an excellent example because it's a type two. So it's a medium level flare. They don't call it a flare right away. They call it a radio emission, which is kind of funny, but important. And the velocity there, I saved this one specifically because I do not remember the velocity really ever getting like that high. So I'm going to have to keep watching that number because I guess it has not been sticking in my brain as much watching these notifications on my own phone. But in fact, yeah, it's... That was a fast one that was happening yesterday. And then we had the fallout of that experience and will over the next three days. So that's the first thing you're going to see on your phone. Then it's going to show you a picture like this. It's going to show you where on the map, the actual flare or the sunshine or the noon sunshine is currently at and how hot or how intense <laughs> has that frequency gotten all of a sudden? And so you can see the impact almost like you're getting hit. The planet is being hit over that area, wherever it is noon, wherever the sun is direct. And we will see these warnings. So wherever you are in the world, you will see where in the world got hit the hardest with these notifications from the Space With Our Live app. So again, like I said, it will tweet you first if you follow the Twitter. But then you will see the notification and you saw that it was a type two radio admission there. So it's trying to tell you how much x-ray radiation we are dealing with. It's kind of cute. They like, they're cute about it. They lead their way up to it. And then the notifications keep rolling in. There's more clarification that comes in. They start telling you what sunspot it came out of. They start telling you what the class of the actual solar flare was. And you'll see as you you'll get these notifications every 15 minutes. There's an update usually after the flare on the Twitters, on the, on the app, depending on the severity. The radio blackouts are important because basically we use, we use radio waves to, to bounce messages around within the earth's atmosphere, as well as out, outward to our craft and so on that are beyond the earth's atmosphere. A technology like this is obviously advanced far beyond the need to be careful, I think, for most solar activity, other than the obvious level of careful, because the sun is still huge. But when these flares hit, that's the area that's going to get heated up. And that's an area where the radio signals are not going to carry very easily. So you're going to have issues in that area, potentially getting signals to your technology. And so that's just something you need to know. So when you get that notification, you're going to be like, "Uh Oh, there's a solar flare and then boom. Okay. Let's see where it is. Or you'll look at the time. Is it noon where I am? No. Okay. Let's look at this map and see where it's really impacting. And then of course, if all of a sudden your technology or something is going weird and you are in this area, it's definitely gonna make a lot more sense scientifically why you're having some problems. So another, but another very helpful thing to know for those of you who like to deal with prepping and emergencies, definitely be watching for solar flares so you know if there's any issues with your radios. Uh, yes. So there is an article on the Space Weather Live website about the 50 strongest flares of 2022. So if you want to look back on the 50, they've already had 50. I mean, it is oct almost October, but 50 so far, the, the most potent ones. And here's a picture of the first, the most potent 10 that we've had so far. So our most potent one this year was 420, April 20th a very special day, very funny, an X2.2. So this is actually also a solar flare. I had a specific synchronicity about this last year. I was watching X-Men 2 when this happened and because my guides told me to. And so it was a cute little, oh, it was a cute little point to the fact that I think perhaps my guides are also paying attention to the specific numbers and making sure I'm paying attention to the very powerful synchronicities about flares. Very important part of my path. 
And I hope so with yours as well, as I continue sharing this passion with you. But yes, number one was an X2. So not too bad, but the year isn't over. Obviously, I am expecting something larger. I'm expecting something maybe twice as big to maybe show up before the end of this year. That's where that's the direction I was guided to after that synchronicity with another synchronicity. So that's just me playfully adding. Clearly, a lot can change. Timelines change. But as you can see here, we haven't had anything more powerful than an X2.2 this year so far, but we've had a decent level of, we had about six X class flares, and then it was down into the M class or medium class in a way I should say of flares. So not as potent, but it depends how direct it was. Sometimes the class is not the best way to know how intense this, the reactions are going to be on the body. So just keep a heads up, but that was just for those of you who like stats and kind of want to know what we're dealing with. What is the severities we've seen so far and lived through? So hopefully that gave you a good idea. Now we want to talk about the fallout of solar flashes, which is around a three-day period. So like I said, you're going to get an instant text. In my opinion, this text is not an instant thing. I in my body, feel the flare, and then I get the text about 10 to 15 minutes later. So their system may be lagged just a little bit just for privacy reasons. And uh, I want to say national security, that that information is, is basically filtered through all of those things before we see it publicly, just in case you didn't know. I don't have any non-governmental sources. <laughs> Everything is being publicly filtered. And unless you have your own telescope that's looking at the sun with a sun filter, which I want some of you to do and start posting online, if you have the power and have the strength, you'll be able to track when one of these sunspots comes turning around and wants to start doing a dance for us. It's a beautiful thing to see. The videos are amazing. More people are going to be sharing them online. I share them all the time. Check it out. Just look up solar, solar footage. Sometimes it's amazing just to watch. So we need to talk about the fallout of solar flashes because even though they're super quick, what shoots out of the sun out of the way kind of gets pushed out of the way when these things happen too is also stuff we have to deal with for days afterwards. We have to know, first off, where these flares can, can, can come out. And then when they do, then we can deal with it. But basically, we have to know what the conditions are for a potential flare. And then we will know also three days after how things are going to go. So first, I'm going to show you quickly where solar flares come from. They come from these sunspots. If you can see, so you will see the photography. You can literally see these on the sun if you have the proper filters and so on with your own telescope. You can see these dark spots. This is actually happening on the sun's surface. There are dark spots happening. And so in these areas, the magnetic field is actually breaking through the corona. And so it's extremely magnetic area. And sometimes it's polarized in one direction positively or negatively. And sometimes there are positively polarized storms that turn into these red dots. And then there's these negatively positive, or sorry, negatively charged storms that are these darker colors. And if a red storm and a blue storm in this condition over here, you see they're kind of close together. If the red storm and the blue storm are a positive and negative node or a sunspot, gets close enough together, they will reach out to each other. If you can imagine magnets do, and they slam together, the energy will slam together in a way from and come out of these, these sunspots and slam together and make this flash. And this flash, like I said, will it then eject out all of the solar plasma and so on, and all these charged particles and frequencies out towards, out into space, basically. These visible 
explosions that are caused by the solar flares are called coronal mass ejections. And these are the funnest thing about watching the sun is the coronal mass ejection, which you can see here in this photo, because first of all, the types of images that you would see are always different and they're beautiful. They're truly beautiful. But what a lot of people do see is actually an embryo or a gestating child when it comes to this first big loop that comes out. The loop will come out and then it will break and the shape will break. It will change shape, of course. Sometimes it doesn't. It kind of shoots out almost like a big loop or a big ball. It's very fun to watch the video footage of that. I share that all the time. Again, the resources for that are in that link tree and you can see the coronal mass ejection movies and the link you will see. And those will load and you can watch those every day because that will also give you an amazing idea about what is heading our way. So these big protruding arms are full of plasma and so on, lots of charged particles. These particular ejections, they don't need a solar flare to come off the sun. There's enough activity that is beneath the intensity of a flare but enough to still shoot off these coronal mass ejections. Mm -hmm. I've noticed it also can happen when it seems like our, our own sun is meeting some type of resistance as it is rotating through and with the galaxy. It seems like our own sun will go through certain more dense areas of space as well. And I can witness, it seems like the sun is getting impacted as it's flying through and it's causing more of this off gassing and these these mat these ejections to kind of come off it's almost as if there's too much pressure and it's it's relieving the pressure from the oncoming uh tension of the heliosphere which we're going to get into so it's good to know that you don't need a flare to have one of these and these certainly are also a part of that three-day fallout that the sun can cause us because this will take three days to fully get here and move past here's a tool that is also in the description and it's also here in the presentation i'm going to I think I'm going to show you this resource. We're going to break so I can show you the other screen in a moment, but I'm just going to show you really quick how to read it. This is the Enlil spiral, they call it. I'm not, you know, names, whatever. All of these programs have funny names. We don't need to get into that. We just need to know how these work so we can protect ourselves from ignorance. <laughs> so here is the earth. The earth is this yellow, little yellow dot on the right hand side. You can see there in the most circular one of these pictures, there is a sun in the center. That yellow or white dot is the sun. You can see on the one edge, you can see the night side is shown with, <laughs> sorry, with the blue and then there's the red, but that's not as important. What we're watching is that little yellow dot on the right hand side, which I've circled there on the middle chart. It's a more specific view. So I would recommend you watch this one and then watch the correlating time in the top left. So you can see, like I've paused it here, what time and date we're going to be impacted by another wave that is kind of spiraling out of the sun as we're being dragged behind it in the solar system. So what does the time say? It says 1800 hours on September 30th, which is now pretty much around now. So the wave, the next wave of solar weather is basically impacting us right now, which we've been seeing. You can actually see a little more and further back in time, there was already more coming in. For those of you who are sensitive, for the most part, we will feel the wave coming in before it, it's actually there because the wave is really actually pushing this, some invisible stuff or some more energy out of its way as it's coming towards us. So we can actually feel that coming much sooner than what science maybe will admit. But I feel as though, and I've witnessed, when it comes to flares, instant, people feel them right away. When it comes to the, the ejecta that takes three days to come here, it is a funny process because the beginning layers is the fast stuff of this ejecta. It's really fast. 
higher vibrational frequencies. Usually it doesn't make you feel slow. It usually can be inspiring sometimes. Sometimes it can cause conflict, but inspiring. And as well, then the more slower moving stuff starts to show up and then it keeps showing up and it keeps showing up. And the slower and slower moving particles actually cause us to be more lethargic. So again, we see the solar flare notification, bing, on our phone, just like we did today. This one is from today. We had an M class, M1 class. You can see that it kind of slammed over Australia and uh, pretty much pretty much the area of the earth where all of the earthquakes are happening, like Indonesia and Papua New Guinea and over by China and into Japan and so on. This whole area is beginning a ton of activity and the sun pushing on it is certainly going to continue that activity. So that's why we also keep watching because some hot spots on earth are also continuing to get messed with by the sun and put that pressure on. So it will help. It will help to know this. It will help to know this for our own personalities too. We get charged up by these as well. So like I said, the type of flare, the speed and where it's at, important to know. And each solar explosion has a different signature. This is a big, big part of what I've learned. Every single thing that leaves the sun is a unique experience. And so watching it is can be a huge ordeal because you're literally watching change happen for all of us. And you just have, you just get to get front row seats, basically. You can ignore the change that's coming or you can get front row seats and really enjoy it, which is what I've chosen to do. So every single explosion has a different class. Like I said, with the X-ray radiation, it also has a different location. So depending on where on the sun, the sunspot flared us or the coronal mass ejection exited, it may not be coming towards us, which is why we also look at this. Because we will watch an actual wave because this moves. I will show you in a moment. This moves and we will watch a wave of solar weather come out. And you can see it's either going to go towards the earth or not. So this is an excellent, this is an excellent tool to know when you see a flare on your thing check this tool after and be like, okay, what direction did it actually leave? And I'll be honest with you, this one doesn't update very fast. So give it a couple hours. Give it a couple hours to check in on that. Maybe not a couple hours, give it, give it a good like half hour, maybe. It should be updated. You'll see, you'll see. And then it updates fast as well to hide the old waves. They push the time forward and forward and forward. So the three-day fallout hasn't even been over for some of the waves, but the, they're no longer on that graph. So it's good. You have to keep watching. The, the data begins to eat itself because the sun keeps updating. <laughs> So I'm going to now share with you what it looks like over a few days in the, in the Space Weather Live app, what it looks like when we are watching the sun flare us over an extended period of time, when there is a big solar storm and we're having many flares out of multiple sunspots potentially, which is the case that we were having just a few weeks ago. So here is an example of our current conditions. This is really happening for us right now. I blew it up as big as I could so you could really look at it. One thing I want to direct you to first before we get into the data reading is I want to show you areas along this jaggedy line you can see here where it cl clearly jumps, like there's missing line. All of a sudden the line is gone and then it comes back and then it's there and then it's gone. I want you to watch those especially because in my study, unfortunately, one of the most reliable things I've seen so far is when I'm predicting something really big is coming, usually one or multiple of the instruments that are publicly viewed are down. They are no longer running for a few hours, maybe even days. We've literally watched some of them go offline for about nine days to hide potentially what's going on. And then there's these more brief moments here where the data is missing for just a few hours or a few minutes, but to delete 
data or hide or not have data during these moments and just have seen nothing, it can have a lot of people turn away and kind of get bored and not take as much of a interest. I think that's why a lot of it's being deleted because this is a controlled narrative, controlling the weather and so on seems to be a big power power draw for those who are unhealthy and and sick in the head. So we are only educating those who are healthy in the head and showing you that deleting data, especially when you're studying space weather, is not helpful for educating anyone. And so it shows what the real motives here, in my opinion, are. It's like about half helpful, half deceptive. So everything you read online when it comes to material and data, everything, everything, every book, every paper, no matter how fancy, no matter where it comes from, it can, there can be lies. There can be things missing. There can be omissions. There can be slight changes to make things seem less, like less in some directions. Basically controlling your emotional response is what I'm seeing the most. The emotional response of humans on earth, I think is the most controlled thing. Because emotionally, when you see a flare, you go, oh my gosh, and you're, you get activated. Anyone does. When I tell you, oh, there was an X-class flare on 420 this year. What do you think? I think that's maybe a little special. Does that make you think, oh, that's interesting. It gets your wheels turning. In my opinion, the science uh, wants to try and stay as private and non-interesting to us as possible. But that's not where I'm at and that's not where you're at. So I want you to watch whenever there is missing data because you may be right on the nose of an actual event that has happened. So watch yourself when you're like feeling the guidance. I'm going to open up and check the space weather right now. And you see that there's a missing chunk like we can see here on September 29th or September 28th or September 30th. We've got some chunks missing today right after the M-class flare there's a whole chunk missing. Now, does that mean the equipment like broke down in space? Like the satellite just couldn't take it and stop recording for a few hours? Potentially, potentially. Or does it mean that maybe it went boom and hit a huge flare afterwards? We don't know. We literally cannot tell you because it's gone. And there's no other place on the internet I've found so far that has undoctored data about this. Help me find it. And I will give you a free shirt about space weather. So if that is appealing to you. Help me out with this data. Overall though, what you can see is these color bands at the top is the M is the yellow, orange is X, red is X, basically X10, which is the next level of severity. Now we may be seeing some stuff going into this level if they don't cut the data out, which they could just continue doing forever. I don't know. <laughs> we will find out. We will, and I will. You may not want to, but I'm certainly going to find out over time. <laughs> what we see with this jaggedy line, of course, you can kind of tilt your head and these gray lines going up and down. Those are the moments when solar flares are actually being reported. That's when the app is likely tweeting you, sorry, or notifying you about a C-class or an M-class flare. Those are the moments when you're going to get notified. But you can see that there's a lot of movement when they aren't notifying you between those gray lines. There's a lot of activity that you could watch. And also I want to note that most of the activity since the 28th has been in this orange line, which is in the C class range, which they don't color code. It's just white on the background here, but the line does get color coded to orange when it goes into C class. You can see here as it's going down into B class, which is the next stage of quiet x-ray radiation, it kind of goes into the green zone. So that's when the scientists are like, oh yeah, that's when we're fine. When we're in a B-class sort of x-ray radiation, that's where we're in the quote unquote green zone, right? But we're getting, we are currently in the orange zone. And I'll tell you what, we have been in that orange zone a lot, a ton. We are almost averaging, I would say, a C-class x-ray radiation level from the sun almost all the time. So it is a little deceiving here. The science is deceiving, but I have sussed out a lot. So I hope what you're getting, I hope you're getting some good nuggets out of this for your own research. 
you can see the time there on the bottom and you can see there on the top you can see three days 24 hours six hours and two hours so in the app you can zoom in get way closer to see the more mi minute behavior you can also see when the last data blackout was for yourself too if you want to go in that so i right now would go into my app i would press the 24 hour button and it would zoom in on this period of time right here i assume and then i can zoom in a little closer to see what happened with the missing flare or what happened right after our m class one today for example so that's what i would recommend you do and that is on the space weather live app as well as the website so let's get into that before i go too far i have to share with you my screen and show you those resources really quick hopefully you can see this oops that's the wrong one which is happening. One second. Okay, here we go. So hopefully you can see this. Here's a 24 hour view. This is on spaceweatherlive.com in the solar activity section. So let's just go there. So you're going to spaceweatherlive.com, right? You're like, okay, I just got the notification that there's a solar flare. I wanna check it out. This is the web version. You're gonna go to solar activity and you're gonna wanna go to solar flares not too hard the same area will be in your app and if not you can just keep scrolling down you will see the chart there click on it i would recommend like i said go look at the six hour situation so we've had multiple over the multiple m classes over the last six hours literally we had an m1 and an m2 so we've been doing really good today excellent day for a class Previously in the day, there's actually quite a bit of time missing here. If you can see, really, over 24 hours, I'd say that's like two hours missing, almost an hour. Let's just say it's an hour, but closer to two, in my opinion, missing after we did have an M1, the first one today. So this is a problem. This is a problem for me. I'm seeing this a lot in the data lately, especially around big solar flares, not loving it. So just keep your eyes open for that. It's probably a sign that there's more going on. That's really all I need to show you. Now. Sunspots is another thing you weren't going to want to look at. When there is a flare, it's going to show you underneath where on the sun it came out of you can see the region here every sunspot is labeled unfortunately it doesn't look like they have the proper labeled photo here but when you do click it it will show you what it looks like what the sunspot looks like this is the one I was showing you today, for example. It's gotten a little more complicated. So these two are flaring against each other, it looks like. Just like the science was proving and I was showing you, we have successful proof that this region indeed was flaring today. So a successful flaring region for me to show you. Now, this is the one where, oh my gosh, look how colorful this is. This is totally different than what I was literally looking at just today. Like I mentioned, check this one regularly if you want, even multiple times a day, because it does update. So we did get a lot of flares. Likely we got some explosions out of the sun. I can show you those in a bit if we're good. I'm trying to keep this under an hour. I did go over. I'm sorry. I'm going to keep going and push through the last few tools here. Here we go with the explosion. So here's our yellow dot. Hopefully you can see my cursor, but here's our yellow dot. Obviously the explosions were going out 
away from earth. But as you can see, it kind of gets swept up in the movement of, <laughs> of it all. And it still causes some rebound in our direction. But sometimes the rebound happens behind earth, if you know what I'm saying, which is what it seems like the case is sort of happening here. But there is some more potency in the stream than usual. So we're going to be seeing some space weather increases again into October, which we were expecting anyways. But that's not what this class is about. I'm trying to show you quickly how to use all these tools the best. So let's switch to back to our presentation. Here we go. So other solar imaging areas that you may want to enjoy are the solarham.com as well. I would recommend. You can see here that they have lots of images. You can even look at the backside of the sun. If you're getting really excited and you're like, oh, I want to see what's going to be coming in the next two weeks, then you can check it out. Here on spaceweather.com, if you're like, okay, I'm feeling the pressure. I need to know how fast the solar wind is going right now. Just right now, the exact number. Just go to spaceweather.com. It'll be there in the top left. This is what I checked today. It was at 542 kilometers per second. Our average is 400, okay? So whenever we start going over 400, likely your body's just gonna start feeling it. We, have, we seem to have a baseline and the science has already figured that out. So when we start speeding up, we start feeling the pressure, we start slowing down, give yourself an excuse being like, okay, it's bearing down on us, it's hitting earth. Earth is getting more than normal. So if I'm feeling a little bit, more intensity or more tired, it should make logical sense. And this will help the busy bodies in your life also know that they're going to be all right. <laughs> it will also let, mention you the last solar flares in that little, that little update area. If you care to just have that check, check that out. So that's another really easy tool, spaceweather.com would recommend. Okay. So now we got to talk about coronal holes. This is a totally different thing that happens on the surface of the sun, but this is what's currently happening at the same time for us as some sunspots and these flares, right? So whenever you just start seeing a lot of stuff, bright spots and dark spots clustering on any of these photos, you know, any of these photos, when you start seeing any type of clustering on the surface, just, just know that there's likely going to be some extra space weather going on that's the easiest most amateur thing you just look at the sun's surface and look look and see if there's anything written on there or any big holes or anything you'll know bright spots you'll be like ooh, that might be it you won't need to know anything else honestly it can be that simple but if you want to know that's why you're here so the coronal holes are openings basically they are magnetic weak points sunspots are magnetic strong points. So they're opposites in a way. The coronal hole is a magnetic weak point that kind of opens up, kind of opens up on the coronal surface and more wind can come out of it faster. More solar wind. So more than the 400 kilometers per second average, there's going to be more. It's going to be faster. It's going to be denser the wind. The density is also important, which they will also tell you here, oops, is how dense it is, which will show, I'll show you more easier way to show that in the next one, the density to check the density. So these coronal holes, unlike a flare, they will open up and they will shoot more solar wind at us over an extended period of time. A solar flare is instant basically and whatever ejecta that it shoots out will travel here in a band of of intensity that maybe will wash over the earth in a few hours when it does arrive that wave or that band that shot out the sun after the solar flare right but when we see one of these guys, one of these homies open up on the surface, we know that we're in it for the long haul and that there's going to be some more pressure on the earth 
over an extended period of time, more consistent pressure from solar wind. So it's not going to feel extreme when it comes on. You're going to feel it coming on and you'll feel it go dissipating and it won't have any sort of major ups and downs. It shouldn't. But what happens usually the body gets sore. And so you need to increase your nutrition and you need to increase rest and minerals and so on. Remineralize yourself. Imagine that you went out partying and had the best time and you need to give yourself that hangover cure. Just do that for yourself after the sun's been shining on you with another 100 kilometer per second jump of solar wind. Like it's a different level of, of stimulus that's wearing you out, but it's something now you need to consider because again, solar cycle 25 is heating up. So we just opened up these holes. It's shooting wind at us. And in between the holes is actually some sunspots. So not only are there so these bright areas on this particular chart, you can see that's where the magnetic looping is happening, where the light is beginning to loop on itself. You can see what the magnetic field is doing because the light particles will literally get sucked back into the sun and they can capture it on camera while they're looking at these less intense or these colder areas. Pretty cool. So these cold areas are fun. Sometimes we like to see what they look like. This kind of looks like a guy with an eyeball and an eyeball and a mustache. And this is the nose and it's got a little hat <laughs> up top. That's the cute, cute side. But yeah, when you see these open up, expect the solar wind to be more intense until literally this spot either somehow closes on itself, which doesn't happen very very commonly, like to just close right back up again, it'll dissipate and the sun will rotate away from us and it'll rotate that area away from us and from facing us. And that's when we get relief. So we basically just have to wait for the sun to keep rotating when we see one of these open up and just, just know it will rotate away eventually, but you can keep, you can, you can watch it day by day, slowly <laughs> leaving earth facing which is basically, if you can see it on the picture, it's pretty much an earth facing situation because those satellites are pretty close to us now in relation. Here is a better way to look at what the solar wind is in a more complex way. You can look at, you can look at the polarity of it, the density of it, the temperature of it, the speed of it. There's a few things. A lot of people like to look at when the polarity is shifting of the wind so it's either like a positive or negative stream in a way of wind. It's kind of funny. It's a little bit more complicated than that for sure. But all of these moments, whenever these charts jump, this was the 27th. This is when things really did start picking up again with the sun was the 27th. So you can see here that we had a change in the nano Tesla. We had a change in the polarity here very brief changes too, went back to normal. Very funny how that happened. The density of the solar wind went up. So we got more dense wind. And then we have a data drop here. See how the data just drops? That's not normal. That's not normal in any data, just to drop all the way down out of nowhere. It's like that solar wind just completely ended and went back to wind speed, wind speeds that are below average for the sun, which is basically impossible. So <laughs> that is a data drop in my opinion. So we got to look for these two. Don't be like, oh my God, something crazy happened. Something likely did happen that was noticeable, but the data is not reflecting it properly. So you can't interpret that. You just have to basically claim, oh, there's an anomaly here, likely because there was some type of extreme space weather. It's very possible. And since then, we've been kind of dealing with this storm really since the 27th. So here in the speed is my favorite in the purple. The speed is the easiest to understand. You can see very gently, the speed actually did go below average for a little while there. Still very funny how that happens. Not too far. I've noticed it go to about 300 something as a way to kind of slow, be slower solar wind. It is an average number though. Let's be honest, the 400 is average. So you'd need to have some days below the average for that to actually be true, science-wise, math-wise. But in this heightened stream, even with the data blackout, you could see it continued at about a 600 kilometer per second over average. That's 200 over average, sorry, 200 over 400. 
and it's kind of sustained in that area. I'd say around 500 for a few days. So the solar wind has been impacting us and a little more pressure the last few days is what you could say. So now quickly, I wanna to touch on astrology and the importance of that with the flares. This is the current development of this study. I've, current, I've downloaded the app Chani, C-H-A-N-I, because it, it'll give me notifications about astrological transits. I have to pay actually quite a bit for this app, <laughs> unfortunately. And if I can find another one that costs less, I will use it. But the transit knowledge, the notifications from this app about the transits is essential for the next level of my study, figuring out what planetary transits are likely to cause solar flares the most. I'd also recommend you download the app Sky Guide or something like it. It's one of those apps where you can literally point your camera and your screen into the sky and with the compass inside your phone, it will know what stars it's pointing out and it will show you the constellations. I really want you guys to be using that even in the daytime and pointing your phones at the sun and looking at what constellations are currently nearby the sun. This is another way to know when we may be getting more heightened activities is when these constellations start piling up behind our sun and so on. Like we, re we have all the time as we go into new, new astrological houses and so on, but more so even other constellations like Pegasus or, or, oh my gosh, the Pleiades cluster or Sirius for example, these are the sort of things that we're watching as well. Like I said, on point three here, I'm watching for these things like lion's gate as well for astrological flaring. So when there's, when everything's flaring and you get your notification and you're sitting here on earth with me, your apps about the sun are going off and you're like, okay, I'm sitting on planet earth. What am I going to do? How am I going to know when this is hitting us for real? It's telling us it's coming. The, the Space Weather Live app is telling us it's coming. When is it going to hit? Well, thankfully, Space Weather Live app will also tell you that when a geomagnetic storm commences, when our geo or our Earth magnetic field starts getting more pressure from solar wind and these waves and flashes that come out of the sun. So this is exactly an example, this photo right here again of the example of where that pressure is the most at that moment when that flare hits. So that area is also going to be likely having all the way down to the core of the earth and through the other side. That is where the impact is happening and is literally moving through our planet. So it's extremely important to know. And what do we watch? What do we watch as earth guardians in those moments? Like I said, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. You can see there on the left, X-ray is pretty fast, is on the higher end of the spectrum. Then it goes up into gamma rays. And then it goes up into cosmic rays. So even faster than X-rays are also hitting us. But our geomagnetic field and our atmosphere is designed to basically bounce away a lot of the access of these frequencies. Not all of them. Obviously, some still get through. And why a major concern has been about our atmosphere's health and why I think a lot of the aerosols and so on has been happening is because we need to remain sturdy with those layers of protection against the cosmic radiation and gamma ray radiation and x-ray radiation and ultraviolet radiation that is coming in to our planetary sphere. And a lot of the experimentations and explosions and military nonsense and the human evolution, basically, that is happening over the last, you know, many generations now has kind of torn up this area and it has been needing to be repaired because we need, we need to be charged properly by these waves from the sun and not damaged, basically. So all this energy transference has a perfect cycle of how it moves through our planetary sphere and moves past us. But with human and whatever problems and innovations, we've been having issues kind of with that natural system, with our natural earth immunity in a way, 
So I think that's, again, why the spraying kind of keeps happening a little bit too. Right before these flares happen, it, they will spray in most areas. You can tell when a flare is coming or when the government knows a flare is coming even further ahead of time now, because you can just go outside every day and see if they're going to be flying planes and trailing over you or not. When you see them, you would, I'd recommend you just stay inside anyways, because the radiation is going to be much higher that day, likely anyways. And those are the protective films and stuff that they're trying to use to make up the mistakes of the past, I think. But I'm not as educated in the current chemistry of that. And it's extremely controversial, but I know that there's logic and there is love there in what's happening as well, which may not be the most popular opinion, but I definitely am also very spicy and I hold them accountable, these companies and this system with my own energy and my own inquiries and this, this whole pursuit here. So we're doing our best. Let's continue. So obviously we're in a heliosphere of the sun. Everything the sun does, we're in its field all the time. So we feel it pretty much instantly. The interstellar wind and everything else pushing on the sun's magnetic field, which is called the heliosphere or the heliopause, it's huge, and it is the sun that's our primary protector from all this other cosmic radiation as well. But the next protector, other than the other planets and our moon, is our planetary geomagnetic field, and the best way to know when our magnetic field is now being stimulated by a storm or by incoming solar intensity is the aurora borealis. It's a beautiful thing. And when the South and North Pole begin to light up in the sky at night, it is basically just those highly charged particles trying to ground in and move past our planetary magnetic field. And it causes this effect. And so it's the first, one of the first and reliable ways to know when, when the solar storms are here because the your Aurora apps and so on will start going off as well and start telling you, oh, there's going to be Aurora tonight, or oh, the geomagnetic storm has begun. Can I click this? Oh, here we go. So here is another wonderful tool which is in my resources, this little guy. I don't know if you guys know a girl in the universe, but she likes to use this one to show us when the energies are hitting earth. Very popular blog that's kind of come up in the last couple of years. She focuses more on this and when the wind is coming in on us and causing this all to light up in red, basically right now, what we're seeing is actually very timid. This is currently our conditions. So here is the bow on the right hand side. This is literally the geomagnetic field of Earth getting pressed down on us. We have this bubble way ahead of our planet, which is here in black, basically, way in front of our planet. There is this magnetic field that's invisible that is pushing outward and catching all this stuff, all these particles, and it pulls what it catches into our poles, and that's what causes that light as well as there is a, a shockwave in a way behind the planet where the energy will gather also. And that's where a lot of that heat and so on will show up. That friction actually kind of shows up behind the earth. A lot of it in front for sure, but a lot actually swoops in behind as well to kind of close, close the gap as that wave is moving around us as an object. It's fascinating. So you can see there on the right-hand side, the bow or the light side or the sun side of the earth is being impacted right now. So if it's sunny where you are, this is the conditions that we're looking at. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay, let's continue. We have a certain classification system now for when these storms hit us, when that pressure starts coming around us, when our magnetic field starts to get pressed in around us, that's when our app goes, hey, there's a geomagnetic storm happening. Or your Aurora app is going, hey, the lights are going to start turning on tonight. Like it's going to be a good one. 
They are classed in different ways, depending on what app you're watching. It could, you could be seeing a G1, a G2, or a G3, or geomagnetic class one, geomagnetic class two, geomagnetic class three intensity. It goes up in intensity. So when you see that little notification, you'll know how serious it is. Usually we only get a one or a two. Three is pretty rare. Here is another chart here that is really helpful to show us exactly when and how powerful that pressure is. This resource is from Boulder, Colorado, USA, this K estimated planetary K index. There's other ones in other countries, depending on the apps you use, they will show you other places. So depending, of course, if you're on the night side or the daytime side of the planet, things are going to be a little different in your atmosphere. And the pressure is going to be different from the solar wind. Definitely worth your time to download these apps so you can get these warnings. Ooh. Okay, so just so you know, for this little chart right here, you can see there on the bottom is time. You can see the dates. This one is from May, an example. You can see there on the left, the KP index, it goes from zero to nine. That is the other index. So it'll tell you geomagnetic storm G1, and then it'll say KP index three or four. Usually it'll have to say four is when it starts getting into the yellow range. And that's when we start getting notifications. So we won't get any notifications about geomagnetic storms until we see start seeing the KP index hitting a four, a five, a six, a seven, eight, nine. Under a four, you're good. It's a little bit hot but you're fine. The storms are hard, understandably so. My own body, I've been training it for years to actually experience the flares in real time and experience the solar wind coming in afterwards. Usually my way to know is when I'm really inspired to actually do stuff with my life and my physical body. Or if I'm really inspired to really work through a conflict that I have been kind of avoiding, usually through um, verbal back and forths with somebody. And it can get heated for sure. But you can blame the flare because usually it'll get to a point of heated sometimes where even I'm like, this isn't me. What This has never been my threshold of experience. Like, what? why am I charged up? What's charging me up? And I'll look at my phone and it'll tell me, Oh, a solar flare. I'll be like, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That makes me feel a lot more human. I appreciate it. When all of this earth matter is rolling past earth, I'm sorry, when the sun and matter, the solar matter is rolling past earth in these waves or in the case of this coronal hole, just shooting more wind at us and this open door policy basically on the surface of the sun, just going for it. We are going to begin getting pressed down on, like I've said so many times, and you're going to be tired. So guardians, I'm directly talking to you now. The cascade of events from astrological to solar cycle to seasonal atmospheric changes are sort of what I'm training you to do, training you to be aware of. I want you to know the seasons, you know, we just had a seasonal change. And I want you watching the astrology with your, your transit apps. And I want you watching the solar weather. And I want you watching the earth impact apps. So I gave you all that stuff in this presentation. You will be getting a copy of this. Please rewind and pause and get that stuff. If you need those resources, reach out to me if you need me about that. And I'm just here to help those who want to help the innocent and support those who are having a lot more symptoms during these heavy storms and feel more confident with the verbiage and the lingo and the resources you can point people at. You don't have to be the spokesperson. There's already spokespeople out there. Just send them in the direction and get them the help they need because a lot of people are struggling with this and it's going to continue, in my opinion, up to 2025, which is why I'm training you. So lastly, when the geomagnetic pressure comes around us, we start getting the KP index going off. The aurora borealis is going off. Okay, is that it? No, obviously. Then what starts happening is lightning starts to happen. 
everywhere pretty much as this literal electricity from the sun is grounding through and past our earth is causing all of this discharge of these positive and negative ions and from the surface of the earth and from the atmosphere this constant smacking of lightning while especially the space weather is moving past us is charging up our atmosphere which actually makes noise it actually makes a sound and this invisible sound is actually in tune with our own brains which is what i teach a lot as well so why do we watch the sun well the sun is about to hit our earth like a bell and the bell is about to get really loud and it's about to completely take over our brainwave activity and sort of unify us on a planet in a way depending on the intensity of the storm but isn't that funny as a i want to say immune response potentially when the sun is hitting the earth so hard all of a sudden all mammals on the planet all their brain waves are going to start sinking up and getting into awake action mode and potentially to their most heightened state which is basically transcendent transcendence in your mental space in those gamma brainwave states and for us to be in those states i think we will have a great level of coherence and could be able to handle more issues <laughs> that may be coming on in that moment so that's a beautiful thing another beautiful part of nature this particular earth song is unique because we have an atmosphere other planets have atmospheres though so they actually actually also have a song too so i used to call this the schumann resonances that's what science also likes to call them and i've popularized this term myself with hours and hours and hours years of time i then learned that this person may have been a very i mean clearly naming the earth's song after some random scientist is a dumb idea in my opinion really 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 stupid and ignorant and disrespectful to the planet <laughs> potentially who knows i'm um, of course it is one of the planet's children that named it after itself instead of after the planet but earth is forgiving and she's like just call it my song earth song venus has her song other planets you know they've got their songs they all sound different we live in the earth song the song is always singing because of that solar wind the sun is always there so the sun is always sending us wind the wind is always hitting our atmosphere the lightning is always going off but it increases during those storms why do we care well, when these storms increase, like I said, our brains begin to entrain to the situation. I think it's a survival thing. It <laughs> gets us to focus, gets us to wake up, literally up out of sleep, which is what happens to a lot of people during these storms as they wake up in the middle of the night and go to my 24-hour Telegram group chat and go, what the heck's going on? And promptly find out all the data is right there for them to see why they're awake. It's almost, it's uncanny now. The, the data really is showing up for itself these days. So I'd recommend now you download the Schumann Resonance app. Like I said, it's the $2 app. I'd recommend it highly for those of you who want really ease of access to the Italian and the Russian information. This will also give you a notification every hour if you want, if you program it to do so, so you can constantly be checking in. If you're a healthcare practitioner or a parent, something like that, where you might want to do be more hourly, watching over things hourly, that would be really helpful. It helps me a lot. And I'm going to show you really quick how to read these. Here is the raw link. So you don't have to have the app if you follow this particular link. So in Russia, they measure extremely low frequency range, the ELF range or the ELF range. When you think about Santa's elves, this is, uh, this is kind of going into that territory, but we don't need to go there right now. These uh, extremely low frequencies are between zero and 40 hertz on this chart. We get to see a zero to 40 hertz window of the atmosphere charge over time. Our own brain waves are in this range. So I love using this tool to basically monitor Earth's brain waves, all the people on Earth and how their brain waves might be behaving on the hour. So that's pretty cool. What's also visible in this is the entire planetary. Oh, no not the entire planetary scale. There's a couple of the 
notes, higher notes missing. But the planetary song I was just telling you, or the Schumann resonances or the earth song, it has multiple notes because it's a closed system. When you hit the bell once, the sound reverberates inside of the system and it creates a scale or a note, a scale, scale of notes, basically, just like any instrument would. <laughs> and the scale begins at 7.83 hertz. That's the primary one. That's the primary average, 7.83 hertz, which is around a theta alpha brainwave state. It's kind of when you're just kind of waking up into being who you are again, out of sleep. <laughs> that is the normal earth brainwave state, which makes sense. We aren't doing things outside of the earth's influence. Most of us, we are all pretty much unconsciously being run by these earth frequencies and as well as the day and the nighttime, basically. <laughs> In Russia, obviously, it's the opposite of time of here, so it's fun to watch. Usually when they're blasting, it's their daytime, but for us, it's nighttime, and sometimes they get hit so hard in the day, people over here on the other side of the planet wake up in the night and see and check the Russian charts and can see that it's currently happening, which is pretty fun. It's a very good way to connect, make our planet seem less isolated from each other. So first you need to know is that the dates are at the top of this one. So just watch the dates. Sometimes this graph will pause and it will stop working. It will stop working. Sorry, just checking the car, the comments, but yes, the harmonics. Thank you. The, this will stop working. So watch the dates at the top, check it every day if you need to. But once you realize that, oh, those dates aren't updating, that's when you know that Russia has decided we got to take a break. And it could be for many reasons. Most of the time, I'm, ex I'm extremely suspicious about it because of the timing. And so that's fun too. So when you start seeing it not moving along, message me right away and be like, hey, I've noticed it's not moving. It's been a couple of days or a day and there's no updates. The hourly is not replenishing itself. I'd be happy to hear about that. And I will share it far and wide as I usually do. There on the bottom is the times in Universal time plus seven, that's where it is in Russia, in Tomsk, Russia is where this is measured. So this is the first info you need to know, the top and the bottom of this chart, easy peasy. Why is this not going? Here we go. And then we need to know the frequencies and how to read them on here. So I flipped it over. This, whoops, <laughs> go back. This symbol on the top right is actually Hertz in Russian. You can see this can, This is the top of the chart is zero Hertz. Nothing should be happening there. So at the very top of this chart, you can see it's completely black, just in that little section there. But it then starts showing data right away and some color all the way down to 40 Hertz, which is here at the bottom. 40 Hertz is also usually pretty quiet. They aren't usually picking up that much stuff after the 28 hertz point. This is a very normal looking chart right now. Hertz is rotations per second of a frequency. Here are your brain waves in hertz kind of lined up with this chart. The first thing is delta. This is you basically, like this is your slowest brainwave state. This is you steep sleeping, barely alive. <laughs> Then your brain kind of starts waking up. It starts going into theta brain waves, And this is the threshold area between three and eight hertz where the first human resonance or the primary resonance of earth lies. So as a mammal, our brains wake up at the same time that the earth frequency is averaging and hanging out pretty much all day. Makes sense. Then we get a little more active and the secondary human resonance or earth resonance is in the range of the alpha alpha brainwave state to into alpha into beta, which is when that's the middle range. So you can see here, see these background lines. I'm going to look over that in a second. That's the, those are the, those are the harmonics that are always there, these horizontal lines, and they're in alignment with our brainwaves. But sometimes you'll notice that certain areas or certain frequencies are heightened more as an example here on the right, you can see that from zero to 40 Hertz, there was quite a bit more 
amplitude going on, more energy coming in for all those frequencies. So let's move on. The whole brain. So here it is again. I lined up where the actual earth resonances are always on this chart. They're always here, quietly running horizontally here in the background. 7.83 hertz, 14 hertz, 20 hertz, 26 hertz, 33 hertz, and 39 hertz, which you can't even really see on here. And then we have a few more, 45 and 60, which is basically the most or the highest part of that harmonic. And then it kind of collapses on itself. So as you can see here again, the brainwave of theta happens around the first frequency of Earth. The brainwave of alpha happens around the second frequency of Earth. Brainwave of beta is the third. Gamma goes into the fourth and fifth arguably according to this chart. Some people think that gamma starts a little bit later than 26 hertz, but we will just play with it for now, just as a basic. So you can see here in the background, these horizontal lines are always there, which is awesome. But there's also problems with this chart, which I'm gonna quickly show you confusion maybe. As you can see, there are these background vertical lines. These aren't always here. This is actually caused by, I am assuming machinery, this is not normal. This is not a part of the earth frequencies. It could even be it could even be deliberate stoking of like towers and so on in the in the atmosphere to try and control it that we're watching. That's my suspicion. But you can also see here then there's so all these vertical lines that are in the background watch for them when they come on and watch from them when they end. In my opinion, it's kind of like the jets at the surface of an Olympic diving pool. I've said this a lot, but the jets disturb the surface tension of the pool. So when the Olympic diver jumps in and, you know, goes from these crazy heights, like 60 meters above the water, they don't break every bone in their body. They are there is a more porous surface for them to dive into basically. So that is kind of what I feel is this background information happening is potentially priming us. So when these bigger flares come, we aren't slammed so hard like an Olympic diver may against a glassy top pool be a little bit different of an impact. Then we have these more vertical lines that are obviously happening there those are a little more intense like so so this is our practice round so um, you're going to open your your app and you're going to see this and be like okay where do i start well you start on the right because that's where the most that's the most recent time and work your way back to the left so in the most recent time this is not from today by the way this is just an example you can see here that there was multiple episodes also, mostly during daylight hours and then during night, it was pretty quiet. Daylight was active, night was somewhat quiet, daylight was active, night was somewhat quiet. That's pretty normal. You can see the daylight hours are happening pretty much the same time every day. But over the here on the bottom, you can look at the times that were most active each day and it does vary. So that is always why we have to keep checking because throughout the daytime, we're just getting hit with different severity until we turn away from the sun and get to have it go to bed for a few hours, take a break. <laughs> but here in the middle is my best example of a zero to 40 Hertz blast. So clearly the atmosphere was charged in the extremely low frequency range, which concerns those people with brains. So when you see these charges, no, oh, people with brains likely were affected by that. That's the most basic comment you can make. Then you can kind of go, okay, well, how many hours were people's brains being affected? Okay, well, we can do that on the bottom here with hours. What specific times were people's brains being affected? You can also find that out there on the bottom, doing some simple just backtracking. Just use your current time and then just walk backwards using the scale on the bottom. That's what I do. You can see that there's so many different things that are happening. And I'm pretty sure there's many different electromagnetic frequency technologies that are also being implemented. So it's tricky, but these love, lovely bulbous blasts that happen are pretty normal. These like cascades of energy, sorry. These cascades of energy that you can see, I've seen those a lot. 
those are not hitting the whole EL ELF range or not our whole brainwave range, it's actually specifying more and would be amplifying just the delta, delta, theta, alpha, and beta more so. And then more into gamma is not as intense. Usually gamma brainwaves don't get that much activity, but when they do, like these blasts, zero to 40 hertz blasts over here, you can see going past 40 hertz, those ones are likely stimulating your gamma brain waves, which is the goodies that we want. Imagine everyone without meditating all of a sudden being able to go into a gamma brain wave state. That's great. That's great productivity for our consciousness rising on earth. So it's good to know when those moments are happening. You can also take advantage of those moments in your life. I tend to go grocery shopping during those times. I tend to be able to stand society when our own electromagnetic field or our atmosphere is being charged more with more lightning. So here is another breakdown really quick of how you read the amplitude of these moments in comparison. I sandwiched these charts. So I kind of chopped out the middle so you could see the top and the bottom, but you couldn't see the middle. So you could see the timing and you can see the first amplitude behavior. So we're going to watch just the first Schumann resonances, which you can see here happens around 7.83 Hertz and keeps going. But then there's these moments where the there's this overlapping blast that happens and it gets mixed up with the Schumann resonance. So it charges. So we can look. So during hour 14, you can see on both these charts, there was this blast here during hour 14 and the amplitude of that blast, we can check hit around a 32.4. And I'm pretty sure this is nano Tesla that is being measured in, but they don't, they do not specify on the site. So it could be microvolt, but I'm pretty sure it's nano Tesla 32.4. Now I've reported and seen this amplitude of the primary Schumann resonance or earth song go up to a 190 back in March 19th, 2019. So a lot of 19s there, but it was true. It was 190 on the 19th in 2019. I'm pretty sure. So, or no, 2018. 2018. So it wasn't 2019, 2018, my bad. 2018 was a huge year for wakeups. I think it's because we were getting majorly slammed by space weather, but I wasn't watching it exactly then the same way I had just started. So I got to see those moments, but didn't even know how to fully comprehend them until now. So we're constantly watching. I watch the primary earth fre frequency because it's usually the strongest. It's usually the one getting amplified the most and the one to note. So when you start seeing people going, the Schumann went to 90 Hertz or 32 Hertz, they're doing it wrong because the Schumann resonance or the primary earth frequency is always in 7.83 Hertz or whatever, always around eight Hertz. So you can see here constantly changing, but then there's these overlapping events that also charge these frequencies from space, basically, which also gets our brainwaves going. So it all overlaps. Italy offers a very low frequency range, so they give you a bigger range of frequencies to watch, bigger than your brain waves, basically. This is more uh, concerning for other technologies and so on that you maybe have around to know about. But when the Italian charts are going off, it's usually a little, a few hours after the Russian, which makes sense because their daylight would be hours after Russia gets their daylight. Their most potent readings are usually during the day. All of this is usually most potent during the day. When it's not, that's when it's a real big deal. When these stations are on the night side and they're getting huge readings, that's a big deal. Ironically, we don't have any reliable station here in North America that I use. And you think we're the free countries. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, honestly. But yes, so in these charts, you can get a bigger range. So if you're more interested in studying a broader range of frequencies, the Italian charts are going to love to show you that. It'll also show you how constantly in the background, all of their electricity in Italy is showing up on this antenna also at 50 hertz. So here's hertz. This is how we're measuring hertz here in the gray bar, zero to 100 on this one, just in this little section here. It's what we're concerned about, this bottom section of the chart. The top section is a little different. 
It's a little more complicated. We don't need to worry about that, but usually there will be correlating, you know, activity on all three of these little sections, but the bottom one's the one I'm most concerned with. This is from today. This was happening as I, as we were beginning the call, we were kind of getting out of this, this big blast that happened in Italy and moving on so with these other little pulses. So you can see more specifically between zero and, and 20 Hertz, there was activity amplifying. And then you can see here on the right, this whole section here is the actual amplitude chart mixed in. So you actually have to tilt your head, look on the right and see that it's negative 20 decibels. So here at the threshold, it's zero decibels, and then it goes beneath zero or negative decibels. So the amplitude of these charges are below decibel range, so you can't hear them. But some animals can, depending on how amplified these frequencies do get, which is my concern, especially when it also comes to this electricity that's always handling. It's in the range of all of us mammals, and it's just buzzing in the background without any breaks they don't turn the electricity off in Italy very often. So unfortunately, all of us, I think, are living in an atmosphere and in an area where we are subject to the electrical grid and in the background as well. So I just want to make a note of that. And that's also why you need to get out of the grid so your body's nervous system can reset because it's constantly being pushed. Some of the nerves are constantly being pushed and you need to let them uh, rep replenish themselves. So they're just going to stop working basically. Here's a bigger range that the Italian, so there's multiple Italian charts. This is the second one here. This is showing you two windows of larger ranges. Here on the bottom is a range from zero to 1600 Hertz and how amplified it gets. Here's the decibels you can see. And then this section right here shows you between zero Hertz and 16,000 Hertz. So much faster frequencies. You can see here that there's some activity happening at around 9,500 9, hertz for a second there. Very, very small amount. But why? And why does it stop? These are the questions you can ask yourself. Again, if you care, you're a guardian, you're curious, we want to know, I want to know, I get it. These, this info is here for you. You can monitor a much bigger range with the Italian charts in the Schumann Resonance app. So that is all that I'm here to show you today. Congratulations, guardians. Please know that I gave you the apps and the knowledge that I have really streamlined after painful processes. So I really hope that you got these, these resources and you're gonna utilize them the best. I worked very hard on this. All of my sources, like I said, are in the link tree. They always will be under every piece of content I make or in any bio on any social media, my link tree will be there so you can get that information. And finally, I'd like to invite you all, if you're interested, to join my Patreon to join Guardian Training and the Space Weather Study on a more continuous basis. The Guardian Training is going to be a once a month meeting where we're going to be meeting up and actually talking about the effects and changes we've noticed our bodies going through as we literally evolve and are experiencing our superpowers turning on and our passion to turn back around and lend a helping hand to the planet. We're going to be cultivating that in, the, in, a, in a group work thing every month from now on for a little while at least of guardian training and then you can donate at any amount on my patreon to join the space weather study in general where i'm going to post every day the most important things that are happening in the space weather and it will go directly to your email so i'd highly recommend you sign up for that if you haven't yet i you can sign up for the guardian training after you sign up for this Patreon at any amount. So just go to the Patreon, sign up for any amount that you feel comfortable. And then later in the month, I'm going to be letting you know about when I'm going to be activating Guardian Training sign up. And we're going to be meeting for the first time and begin our superpower activation workshops that we're going to do every month alongside our space weather watching. So is there more that I need to share with you? Of course, there's more. We cannot forget about weather, <laughs> the weather that's stirred up from all this, all of us watching the hurricanes. This is directly impacting. It causes weather and storms to form. Earthquakes are also a major problem that are a part of this and the volcanoes, of course. So I'm not an expert on volcanoes and earthquakes, but I would recommend that you go to Dutch Since on YouTube if you haven't yet and follow him because he is watching Earthquake Impact. 
He's able to map earthquakes, predict earthquakes based off of previous earthquakes. And we know where the earthquakes are likely going to be beginning that cor that that uh, process and that sort of reverberation that this guy can measure is because we'll know where exactly the earth got hit with a solar flare and with that instant pressure and instant slap from the sun and that reverberating through the earth can cause the the continents to basically move and i'm assuming that's how the continents did move was just through time with the earth press getting pressed on by these solar explosions moving the continents around so that is very cool it does take a long time but we are watching a lot of earthquakes and a lot of volcanoes going on so much to enjoy later as well and if you were living near any of these locations like a, a ley line or a volcano i would recommend you move away from that when uh, before 2025 because i'm assuming earthquakes and volcanoes are just going to increase in their activity up to 2025 as well and um not the most wonderful thing to learn or experience a volcano and wouldn't recommend <laughs> wouldn't recommend rec recommend being near one during these big storms these big solar storms so another good thing to watch solar flares going off you live near a volcano maybe leave <laughs> maybe just go in a different direction especially if it's either on the opposite side of the planet of you that this flare happened and hit the opposite side of the planet as you and this volcano or if it's directly impacting you and where this volcano is just watch for that for sure and that's the direction i'm kind of going with this study too so astrologically and volcanically ironically we're going to be starting to work more with that too so really exciting the advancements of this study it's going to keep going i hope that all these tools are helpful thank you again for joining my patreon at any amount patreon.com slash ascension diaries so we can keep watching the space weather together i can keep educating you and inviting you to these opportunities and yeah, we're going to do guardian training, which is going to be so much fun. So we're going to be utilizing, utilizing all this information to train, to be superhuman. So who doesn't want that? <laughs> now we are in the question and answer mode of the presentation. Congratulations, everyone. We made it to the question and answer mode. I am ready to field your questions. So go ahead and start asking them in the chat box. And I'm going to answer them as harmoniously as I can. All right. So I see a question from Tawny. I have to jump off early. Can you provide some examples you have personally experienced and notice when the data is blank? I am a practitioner, practitioner and very curious about what you may have noticed within yourself. Ah, perfect. The irony is, I know you're not here, but I'm glad that you came. The irony is a lot of the blackouts that happen often happen when I am also either trying to teach a class about this, go to a conference and present about this, or there is some other type of large gathering of people that I'm going to be around in the physical. For some reason, that is where my path has led me. The first time I noticed that there was a data blackout on the Schumann resonance in Russia was October 2019 when I was meant to present on it in front of an audience for the first time at a at a conference slash festival thing. So I couldn't even look up the current data of the day I was presenting because it was not there. So that was fun. And it was also a really good example for people to be like, oh, there is some synchronicity to this. There is something going on to this. There's some divine there's a divine hand in all of this motion, which there certainly is. We do naturally orient ourselves with these energies unconsciously. I'm just trying to bring it more to the conscious mind so we can actualize it better. We can work with it better. So that's an example. This last September, there was another blackout for about eight days, the first eight days, I think, of September. So again, data blackout big deal people were thinking it was going to be 10 days of darkness they were very excited it has not ever gone past 10 days of darkness yet if russia ever does do that it'll people will definitely be thinking it's a prophetic situation even though it's the planet's not going dark 
just that one specific online resource for electromagnetic frequencies is not uploading. It's not that big a deal, but for me, as I've centraled myself around this data, it is a big deal. And some people really do rely on it. So for synchronicity, for synchronicity sake, very important. Also, again, solar, some of the solar satellites also just go down for maintenance. I've seen that a couple of times. And then I watched the earth, not just the solar satellites that are relaying data to us, but the earth-based resources were also going down during that time. And I don't remember what that when that was, but it was this year. I think it was early this year. I saw that happen. I'm pretty sure. Again, super suspicious. I'm sorry, I don't have a date on that one, but there's some examples. I'm glad it was helpful. Do solar flares and CMEs still affect us energetically, even though they aren't earth directed? 100% yes, they do, because we live in the heliosphere. We are living in basically the, in the field of the sun, the body or the greater body of the sun. So in a way, we do not escape anything the sun is doing because we are living within its body or in its extended body. So everything is felt by us, but it's just the severity is definitely different whether or not it's an earth-facing situation or not. But we feel it either way. Question. I usually feel a huge head pressure or feel like I'm being plugged into an electrical socket with an overwhelm of energy, sometimes even feeling out of body. I have clients that feel something similar. Would you say this is the most, this most likely is the effect of solar flares? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. And not only just the solar flares, because I find even solar flares actually give us a bit of a, a hit. So maybe that electrical socket situation for sure. And maybe that head pressure before that sun even releases that flare, I've noticed, we will feel. We will feel right before the sun is about to also release because we are so intrinsically connected to it. Then those symptoms of overwhelm and of, of pain and of pressure, it usually is caused by that displacement of the sun, whatever it is that it did do. So it's real... It's one of my favorite easy go-tos. Like, did you check the sun after you're having some sort of issue with your body? Check check the space weather real quick. Almost always there's an answer I found, which is why you guys are here. Question, does any of this impact air quality on earth? Absolutely it impacts air quality. The way air is being shuffled around in our atmosphere is also due to the outside pressure and heat from the sun. So with the air quality, well, air quality can change and become more stagnant in areas when the sun is not as active, I would say. But when the sun is more active, the air is likely going to be moving around a lot more on Earth. So there's going to be more wind and there's going to be more stuff moving around in the wind. May also help with fertilization uh, and spreading of seeds of plants during the solar cycles because there's going to be more actual wind on Earth also being pushed around as from the outside of our earth, we're getting pushed on by solar wind, which is pretty cool. So air quality on earth, yes. And obviously atmospheric changes due to the storms and so on. When storm fronts are pushing in, they push it they push in front of them dead orgone energy or dead energy. So it usually causes pain when it moves through us. Similar when the, the front from the sun is coming through that's why we kind of get a little pain as well before it kind of impacts us. I've noticed it's kind of moving that stagnant energy through our body really fast. It's pushing it through really quick all of a sudden to kind of clear out for the new storm that's about to hit. Has anyone asked these agencies why the data is blacked out and their response is yes, they have people, people ask them all the time, but there is no responses so far. So go ahead and try. Maybe you will be the chosen one. I would love to know. Continue, continue to try and reach out to them. Most of these resources don't even have much of a friendly interface to contact them with. Surprise, surprise. So do what you can. We're all out here really as civilians kind of pushing back up against the intense privatization of knowledge, science, and workforce, I want to say. 
from the civilian place. Question, the body feels solar wind at speed, at speeds 400 kilometers per second and above. Yeah, it's more so a, whenever it goes above the average, we really start to, we start to notice. We for sure start to notice. And there's actually areas on the earth. It also depends on your elevation. I forgot to mention, but elevation is a big deal too. Obviously, the, high, the closer you are to the upper atmosphere, the more of that radiation you're going to be getting. So more intense reactions. So maybe the solar wind speed going 400 is still going to impact you way more than your buddy who lives at sea level, for example. Question, remineralize. When solar winds are strong and we were in the, in the sun, Ah, uh, yes, we are remin remineralize your body on purpose with supplementing, like getting the water soluble minerals and so on. So you can add that back to your body because when we are processing and moving these charged particles through our body, which eventually make it to our physical bodies through all the layers of our atmosphere and such, it does wear us out. It does burn our calories. It does make us work and process harder. And a lot of what I've noticed that gets processed out the fastest are these minerals and basically our, our electrolytes. So shilajit is an option for those of you, especially for men. They have an excellent amount of minerals in there. Shilajit, I have a coupon for that for you guys as well in that link tree area. It's just above the space where the links, you can see the Sheila G you get 10% off for that order. I have to order some more too. Really good for men, especially if you're having issues with testosterone levels and you're kind of feeling a little bit too uh, feminine with your uh, hormones, this will help for sure. Kind of get you back on track, but be careful because it really will give you a boost. So, I mean, you're not going to be just growing muscles out of your eye eyelids, but you're going to be feeling it. So, and with women too, and also be careful because it'll cause your intestines sometimes to just kind of get too overexcited and kind of move everything out. So it's a good cleanser as well. Um, do try it for the first time when you're at home near a bathroom is what I'd recommend and hope that your body will absorb it. Just, you really need very, 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 very small amounts of this stuff too. It'll last a long way. If that helps. Is it okay for us to share the recording of today's session? Um, yes, I believe I'm going to be posting this on my YouTube channel for everyone to watch. We will see, but I'm going to for sure email you the recording, all of you who were here. Do you believe that these storms, flares, CMEs affect earth and our frequency? Yes, 100%. That's why I do this study. The study is to prove that there is actual evidence and the exact timing of when our own earth's frequency is being charged when it is being manipulated, I want to say as well, and when it is beneficial for us and when it is risky for us. All of very important things. A part of me really wants to be able to go underground into like a deep underground cave and feel what that's like on some of the days where the space weather is really intense. But one thing I learned recently by going into some of those caves is that at least my own psychic abilities to be a medium didn't go away. There was no separation between me and sort of that layer, even deep underground. And I had perceived that I was potentially getting messages from, you know, above ground in the atmosphere, in the heavens, in a way. I tend to look up and feel like it's coming from above me, this information through the crown. But even deep, deep, deep underground, I was able to channel information about a woman's parents that had died and literally gone back to the Pleiades. Like you can believe me or not, but as a medium, I have these conversations all the time. It will come, it's all these random things come through. Like it's just going to be, it's just a crapshoot. I just work with a ton of star seeds. So sometimes it's, oh, your dead loved ones are blah, blah, blah over here and over here. And I'm sensing them over here. And that's just the case. So, the earth's frequency is actually kind of hard to get away from. And at least the intensity from the radiation of sunlight, you may be able to get away from underground, likely. And that relief may be offered to us 
during 2025 in some way or another. Honestly, some some of us may find our way <laughs> into some type of spelunking situation, maybe during some of those really intense days, just by accident, just by sheer coincidence of the universe, right? To protect you from what could be happening in 2025. So just keep that on, on the back of your mind. Think about the closest public cave um, is and where you can maybe go underground to get a break and how far underground it is. <laughs> And also know where the highest points are, where the mountains are too, because that's where all of the energy is also going to gather. And you can also release and get new upgrades from tops of mountains a lot easier. Release the stagnant energy, lift the vibration up and out of you and get new information and kind of air it out. That's what I've noticed also. Thank, oh, you're welcome. I'm glad that you liked it. I'm, I know, I know it was a long one. I'm glad you're going to watch the recording question. This may be to come back later, but I'm curious what the impact of these frequencies may be on ADHD. Excellent question, because I certainly live with somebody who is experiencing these similar kinds of sporadic brain activity. When it comes to the sporadic brain activity, I noticed that it definitely gets harder for people to focus when the charge of the atmosphere starts getting intense. When there's lightning storms overhead, you know that that's when really from space even that there is a lot more energy bouncing around and trying to ground and correct itself. So if you can imagine when there's energy bounding around not correcting itself, it's likely going to also stir up another person who's un ungrounded themselves. But a beautiful thing about people who have any type of brain irregularities is that when the atmosphere gets charged to a certain amplitude, your brain will literally not be able to stop itself from matching whatever that is instead of what it's doing. So anyone with any type of issue with their brain if the atmosphere all of a sudden gets charged to a 190 amplitude, but in the fourth Schumann resonance or fourth earth frequency around, you know, 40, 36 Hertz, that'll be in the gamma brainwave state. And then all of a sudden, potentially everyone's brains are going to entrain unconsciously to the greater, to the greater body to the greater mind of our planet in a way. The next fractal up of us is our earth in a way. And uh, you could be free and in coherence in those moments. Also though, with alpha brainwave, that's another great brainwave state to be at. And the human resonance number two is often charging that area and that can cause Again, alpha brainwave, amazing place to be where you can be at peace. I think ADHD is when people kind of get stuck in beta brainwave and they keep thinking like they need to finish and do tasks. And so they keep bouncing around because the anxiety of one task is making it harder for them to do the next task. So there may actually be some relief for these people during these storms or it could be the opposite. And I really have noticed, even with myself, it's very hard to know what direction you're going to go with it. That's the fun of this whole thing is that I can be a doctor to a degree, but I cannot directly predict how you're going to react, but I will take notes and do my best to keep growing the library of that information for future, for, for the future, basically and following along with those inquiries the best I can question how long does the sun take to make one rotation i believe it is 21 days it could be 23 21 to 23 days i didn't write that one down i'd have to look that up for you it might be longer 27 days excuse me so 27 days it says that it rotates all the way around its axis, which is pretty good. One month, kind of. You feel supercharged when the when the flares are hitting, and then
you're not feeling tired during the coronal, uh, the CMEs are hitting in the geomagnetic storms, which is interesting. That's amazing. We want people not to be lethargic. That's the goal. So if we're trying to kind of find the place of weakness in some people as well. And where I've noticed the place of weakness is this, this subtle weakness to these electromagnetic changes. And then see if you can ground more and get your system, your own body's electromagnetic system healthier so you can channel like a copper wire, this energy through your body into the earth really easy so it doesn't get stuck in your body. That is key. So keeping yourself like nice salt water, keep yourself, keep yourself conductive and get all the heavy metals out of your body, all the plastics out of your body. It will help keep you the most conductive as possible. So energy doesn't get stuck in any of your muscles. My energy gets stuck in my right shoulder a lot, my right shoulder blade temple area. And, um, and that's just because I use that area a lot for writing and for it's my dominant hand. So it's actually an area that I use a lot. And so it actually probably has the most need for repair. So that's why it gets sore. So usually the areas that are causing us the mo most problems during these storms are areas that are already problem areas and it's just being amplified. So the final advice for all of this, and thank you all for joining, is keep your own circuitry of your body as healthy, happy, and efficient as possible. There is many, 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 many ways you can do this keep up with me on Patreon and so on. And I will keep sharing ways to do this, reach out, get the resources you need. Just take what I've given you and do what you need. It has been an honor again, to hold this space and share this information with those of you who are interested in learning. And I want to thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart for participating in this study with me. It means so much that I can go out in the world and find people to discuss this with, be curious about this, and then pass on the knowledge because unfortunately this was not taught to me in school. And I'm fairly sure most of us is we're in that boat, which is very sad and what inspired me to begin teaching this work after I graduated my psychology degree back in 2015. So it's been a longer haul since then. I gave up those systems in order to actually serve people with honesty and do true research. Unfortunately, those big names are not doing those things. And I saw from the inside and I now sit proudly and happily on the outside of that crazy, crazy city of official science narrative. And I let them have their thing and I take the pieces that resonate and I study them and find if they're true. And then I add them to my own study, which is how we have gotten here. Nice to meet you all. I'll see you around. Have a great weekend. I love you and thanks for spreading the love.